sometime. Somehow, we will be punished. Punished? Alright, so this is a little post I saved on r slash Castaneda a while back. I just thought, why not share it, you know? Like, I decided to go through all my saved stuff, and I decided maybe I should share this with everyone. I've kept it to myself all this time, so maybe it's a call from the other side to help others who may come to this video. So, as far as I know about Castaneda, it's not much. He was like a Mexican sorcerer, I believe. And he worked with dreams, the concept of dreams. And he eventually made it to the other side. He knew his time was coming, and I honestly believe the story. I only listened to one of his books, and I found out that his path wasn't for me, but... This is an interesting topic. It is how to see energy in three weeks. So it starts with this. And I should also mention that the tag is called Dark Room Practice. So I assume that this is a Dark Room Practice instructional. It's been a while since I've read this myself. I'm just going in blind since I didn't read this beforehand. I just know that... I saved it for a reason. So it starts as so. I'm Dan from Carlos's private classes. My intent is to contribute to Persa, to preserving something precious, the accumulated knowledge of Carlos Castaneda. In the mid-90s, Carlos told us the story of how he'd written a how-to book. He said it was left in a theater by accident and lost. He took that as an omen not to write it. But a year before he died, people in his classes started being privy to things not written before, or at least not emphasized. As it turned out, they had, rece uh, they had received advanced copies of parts of his last three books. Those were his how-to book, recreated as three. The difference between his earlier books and those was a matter of emphasis. In his earlier books, you had to dig through the stories to find techniques, and there seemed to be so many. Which to emphasize? His last three books tell you what to emphasize. To that end, he created The Wall, which is a beginner's game of intent. It teaches how to see energy by activating the second attention while awake, with the eyes opened. It teaches what intent is, because you get to see to what extraordinary level intent fills in the missing details of perception. It also provides access to dreaming without all the effort. In fact, you could say that once you learn it, dreaming will come to you. You won't have to pursue it. Even better, the dividing line between being asleep and dreaming and being awake with the second attention activated becomes very blurry. It took me 50 years to learn this, starting from the very first time I ran into Carlos at Morongo. Not to say that along the way there, were, no, there wasn't plenty of other interesting stuff, but this marks a turning point. If you learn to see energy as filaments, bundles, and bands of emanations, you won't be drowning in doubt. Here's the steps. First, practice recapitulation and dreaming until you have the gist of both. In the recapitulation, you reduce the impact of emotional memories. You'll need that to curtail the internal dialogue. Recapitulation also enhances dreaming because you are practicing focusing your attention on something imaginary to make it more real. Dreaming teaches you what it feels like when the assemblage point moves, how to hold it in position, how to change dreams, and you get your first encounters with inorganic beings. Yes, some of those phantoms are actually inorganic beings. That's the setup. It's not part of the three weeks, but if you haven't done that, the three weeks will be a lot rougher. And hopefully before you try this, you've had some experience with shutting off the internal dialogue. 
If you ask how can I shut off my thinking, I'd fall over and be unable to do my job. Then you'd need to practice it first until you realize that petty internal dialogue is only a bully and a foreign installation. We weren't born with it and it didn't completely take over until around age 12. Meditation is good experience for shutting off the internal dialogue. Every form of meditation I've studied works by altering the internal dialogue. It's just done in a more friendly and comfortable way than doing it directly, probably because people teaching meditation would have no students if they advocated what I'm about to tell you. They'd go out of business, thus almost no one is teaching this. You start by curtailing your internal dialogue all day long. Every time you remember, shut it off and fight hard to remember constantly. If you forget more than half an hour, you aren't trying hard enough, and hopefully there won't be too many hour or half-hour lapses. If there are persistent thoughts, recapitulate them on the spot. Turn the head, do the breath. Do your best to eliminate that barrier. On day one, it's excruciating, and you'll try to convince yourself that it's impossible. On day two, you'll forget less often, but it'll still be horrible. But on day three, it'll be awful, but no longer horrible. On day four, you'll be thinking maybe it's sort of lovely. By day five, it'll almost be easy. Go for a walk while doing it. If you've attained super hearing, super sight, super smell, and super touch, you're doing it right. It should be noticeable. It's caused by the lack of filtering between your senses and your perception. Of course, nothing really has increased, but you've stopped ignoring most of it. Now you're ready. Go buy some aluminum duct table, some painter's blue tape, and some cupboard or cardboard boxes. Cover your windows, seal the edges with blue tape, cover over all the LEDs on electronics in the room with aluminum tape, and generally, uh, generally make the room so dark that you can't move around without touching furniture. You want it so dark that you will actually become disoriented when you, uh, when you start to see energy. Some leaks, such as a barely noticeable edge of light from the window, can be useful for landmarks once you start walking around. That was the easy part. Now it gets harder. If you're married, chances are you can't do this. You need to find three extra hours at night when it's dark outside for practicing looking for colors. I found that it's best done after waking up in the middle of the night because your assemblage point is looser from sleeping and dreaming. And you can be absolutely sure if you practice curtailing your internal dialogue all day long, your dreams will get very long and very episodic. You'll also start to have guest appearances in your dreams of characters you vaguely remember. Curtailing the internal dialogue is the absolute best way to save energy something Carlos emphasized daily in his classes. But you could do it at the start of bedtime, too. Set up on the bed, I prefer, uh, I prefer cross-legged with pillows behind and below me for support. I stare at the darkness with your eyes open and looking for colors. To save you some time, yes, those are the colors. Those vague things you feel stupid for thinking are what you're after because they're probably just how the eye works or defects, or maybe age-related issues. Those are them. Keep watching, and they'll get brighter and brighter. Over the next few days of practice, when you start to see not only vague puffs, but also vague twisted lines, get up and walk around. Look for more on the floor, on the walls, anywhere you can think to look for them. Don't worry if they are not directional. They might only appear where your head and eyes are looking, but you can be sure you'll eventually find some that are stuck to one spot and look absolutely real. Like you forgot to cover an LED on an electronics on the floor. Once you can see them as you walk around, try very simple tensegrity moves. Mashing energy is easy to see. It actually works, although the amount that gets mashed is kind of pathetic. That's probably why Carlos said you could do them hundreds of times if you wanted to. You need three hours for this practice so that your eyes get very used to the dark. 
You're employing your super sight here, and it works even better when it adjusts fluffy or fully to the dark. After looking around a bit, go back to bed and try to scoop up some of the colors. Mostly I see a nearly gray-blue puffs with occasional other colors. You'll find that your hand can gather it and deposit it on your body. Pour it down your face, as in the tensegrity move, or just move it around. It's even possible to gather up a puff, blow into it to make it brighter, and get it to float off. In one class, Carlos tried to show this to us, but no one seems to have gotten it. Carlos realized we thought he'd gone nuts and was embarrassing himself, and he gave us a big grin saying, No? Don't be worried if you don't see what I just described. Everyone is different. What you're doing is learning to activate the second attention with your eyes open. That's when it becomes possible to see the purple clouds Carlos described which are part of Patanjali's lights. Ooh, I see all of Patanjali. Ooh, Patanjali's colors, including the brilliant blue pearl. I used to watch them on the ceiling when I was five years old. When I asked my mother, she convinced me to stop doing that. If you get to see the purple cloud with twisting and intermixing absolute black and with red and orange color on the edges, you're talented. It's a lot harder to see when you're grown than at five years old. Pat yourself on the back. In fact, give yourself a big thumbs up right then and there, and anytime you see that purple cloud, I also recommend saying hello to the first hypnagogic phantom that you see each night. You'll need them to get some of the effects of the wall. I'm afraid it's possible that Carlos's sorcery needs inorganic beings to function properly. Now, to the wall... The wall is an effect of the second attention, so you can't make any rules about what it looks like. While doing stalking and practicing silence in Asia, I once saw the wall for two weeks straight. Every time I closed my eyes, it looked like bad wallpapering from the 1970s. But more common is for the vague lights and colors you see in darkness to sit flat on a virtual surface. A flat surface forms in front of you, perhaps six to ten feet away, and although there may be a real wall behind it, it doesn't correspond to any actual thing. If you look up, you could see it on the ceiling. If you look down, you'll see it on the bed. Try to touch it. You'll see. It's in front of the actual surface there. Now you're seeing the wall. Don't forget that you had to force si um, silence during all of that. But what can you possibly do with the wall? Plenty. More later. These posts are limited to 10k characters. And he goes on in the Reddit thread. So I'm going to post it for any who are interested in diving deeper into this topic. I wish you guys luck on your journeys. And just remember to just stay safe out there.